So last week, I had the great pleasure of having Academy Award-winning director Oliver Stone and historian Peter Kuznick on the show. They were here to talk about their new Showtime series and book called The Untold History of the United States. But the part you didn't see is the discussion we had after that interview, in which I got their opinion on Obama's policies, the current state of play in the United States. Take a look. So it took both of you four years to produce this series and, and almost the book. five. Almost five. Um, and in it, you have a chapter called Obama: Management of a Wounded Empire, where you give a, a harsh critique of the Obama administration. What, in your eyes, has been the most troubling aspects of his presidency, Oliver? Well, I think that uh, under the disguise of uh, a sheep's clothing, he's been a wolf. <laughs> Uh, that because the nightmare of the Bush presidency that preceded him, people forgave him a lot. He was a great hope for change. The color of his skin, the upbringing, the internationalism, the globalism seemed all evident. And he's an intelligent man. But he has taken all the uh, Bush changes and he's basically put them into the establishment. He's codified them. That's what's sad. So we're going into a second administration that has living outside the law and does not respect the law as a foundation of our, of our system. And he is a constitutional lawyer. Yeah. Uh, you know, without the law, there is, a, it's a law of the jungle. You see, Nuremberg existed for a reason after the, and there was a reason to have trials. There's a reason for a due process, habeas, habeas corpus, they call it in the United States. Do you yeah. agree? <laughs> I agree totally. Yeah. Uh, if you look at his domestic policy, he didn't break with the Wall Street friendly, friendly policies of the Bush administration. If you look at his uh, transparency, he claimed to be the transparency president when he was running for office. There hasn't been transparency. We've been actually classifying more documents under Obama than we did under Bush. All previous presidents between 1917 and 2008 indicted three people total under the Espionage Act. Obama has already indicted six people under the Espionage Act. The surveillance hasn't stopped, and the incarcerations without uh, bringing people to trial ha hasn't stopped. So th those policies have continued. And then the war policies and the militarization policies, we maintain that. We're fighting wars now in Yemen. Uh, Afghanistan. We're talking about keeping troops in Afghanistan. We haven't cut back on the things that we all found so odious of the Bush, about the Bush administration, and Obama has added some of his own. The drones policy, Obama had more drone attacks in his first eight months than Bush had his entire presidency. And these are a very, very dubious international law, legality. Uh, and Peter's more hopeful on the second term that it would, yeah. there would be some more flexibility. We hope so. but. There is a system in place that is enormous, the, uh, the Pentagon system. Yeah, it's almost seems, hard to buck. it almost seems like he took the, you know, the, the odious CIA policies and just branded them. So it's now acceptable that the assassinations, the extrajudicial judge, jury, executioner of, of people right. without due process. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, um, we complained during the Bush years that Bush was actually conducting surveillance without judicial review. <laughs> surveillance. <laughs> Obama is killing people, targeted assassinations without judicial review. That to us is obviously much more serious. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, and to the history, you cover Pearl Harbor, which of course led to the internment of Japanese American citizens. I don't think a lot of people really acknowledge that, once again, a, an underreported aspect of really what that meant. When you look at the surveillance grid in America today, it, it almost seems like it is an open air internment camp where they don't need to intern people anymore because we have this grid set up in place. What, yeah. what do you guys think the, about the, that? The, the, we, the U.S. government now intercepts more than 1.7 billion messages a day from American citizens. 1.7 billion. That's email, that's telephone calls, that's other forms of communication. Can you imagine that? 1.7 billion? We've got this apparatus set up now with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, over a million people with top security clearances. We've created this kind of nightmarish state. This is a 1984 kind of state in many ways. We say, well, well five, million, trustworthy. five million uh, clearances, one million top, top security, security top clearances. Security, That's yeah. a pretty heavy number. In other words, we are living in a fishbowl. And I think the sad part is that kids, the younger people, accept it. Uh, they're used to invade. They don't say, well, you know. And it's true. I mean, how can we follow the lives of everybody? But the truth is that we're all ultimately watching ourselves. It is an Orwellian state. It's, it may not be op oppressive on the surface, but in our hearts, we have to have a certain, we, there's no place to hide. There's no, uh, there's really no place to hide. You, some part of you is gonna end up in a database somewhere. 
And it can become oppressive on the surface. One of the things we feared after 9-11 was that if there was a second terrorist attack like 9-11, the Constitution would be gone. I mean, we, the crackdown would be so egregious at that point. And, and there's still this obsessive fear. The United States fears things. We fear the rest of the world. We spend as much money on our military security intelligence as the rest of the world combined. You know, do we have enemies? Are we really so threatened? Do we really need this anymore? Is that what our priorities should be? And we think not. We want to turn that around. Yeah, the evisceration of the rule of law, especially, you know, most notably the, the National Defense Authorization Act, which, which eradicates due process and our basic fundamental freedom in this country. The, um, I wanted to also bring up another interesting point that really struck me in the, in the film series, which was the kamikaze pilots who, uh, you know, they were brave. They were considered, it was the bravest act that you could do. And then it just, I can't help but think of suicide bombers today. Yeah. And, you know, Bill Maher, he goes out and loses his show for saying these people are brave. And then you have people like Ron Paul get up there and talk about blowback as a reality. And he's, he's ridiculed. I mean, how do we get here where the discourse is just so dumbed down where we can't even acknowledge obvious truths such as that? Primitive discourse. Yeah. Uh, there's been a worship, a blind worship of the military and patriotism, jingoism that used to be called. Uh, I, you know, I, I strongly believe in a good military and a strong military, but to defend our country, not to invade other countries and to co try to conquer the world. And I think there's a huge difference and it's been forgotten. Morality. If once you take the law away, as Einstein once said famously, if a country doesn't obey its laws, the laws will be disrespected. So it seems that we, a fundamental morality has been lost on us somewhere along the way recently. And it's, it's who wins. It's what's effective. Can we kill bin Laden without having to bring him to trial? Can we just get it done? And that get it done mentality justifies the ends. And that's where countries go wrong and people go wrong. All our lives are moral equations. Does the end justify the means? No, it never did. And the other side of what you're asking is about the constraints upon political discourse in this country. Why are people so uninformed? It's what we're trying to deal with in this series. If people don't understand their history, then they don't have any vision of the future and what's possible. If they think that the now, what exists now, this tyranny of now, is all that is possible, then they can't dream about the future. They can't imagine a future that's different from the present. That's why we're saying people have to understand their past, because if you understand the past, if you study the past the way we're presenting it, then you can envision a future that's actually very, very different. And we've come very close on many occasions to going a very different direction in the future. We yes. came very close in 1944, 1944 to avoiding the atomic bombing and potentially maybe not having the kind of Cold War that we had. We came very close in 1953 upon Stalin's death to ending the Cold War. We came close in 1963 when Kennedy was assassinated to ending the war in Vietnam, ending the Cold War, having a very different direction. The early Carter years, again, was the possibility of a different direction. And at the end of the Cold War, in 1989, uh, Gorbachev was reaching out to Bush. Did Bush take that olive branch that Gorbachev was giving him? No. Very much different. What do we do instead? We, we applaud the Soviets for not invading when countries were liberating themselves from the Soviet Union. And then we immediately go and we invade Panama. And then we invade Iraq. And so we're saying that that's great. We, that's great that you show con restraint, but we're not going to because we're the hegemon. As, as Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, under Clinton says, if the United States use force, if we use forces because we're the United States of America, we're the indispensable nation, she said. We see farther and stand taller than other nations. That's the attitude that Oliver and I are challenging, the sense of American exceptionalism. The United States is the city upon the hill, God's gift to humanity. If we do it, it's right. And that's not acceptable. It's very funny because we go from, you know, we, we've been, the book has been out a few weeks. Uh, the series has been playing for the fifth week now and it will be 10 weeks and all. We go to TV shows and we sit in these uh, beautiful sets and they're always rushing and rushing and they got news here, they got news in, in Gaza, they got Petraeus, they got uh, Obama. Okay, well, what are you talking about? Oh, history, you know. Oh, okay, well, history, that's, what does that have to do with today? But okay, what's your point? So you, you sit there very patiently and it's very bizarre to me, I don't know about you, but you know, well, honey, uh, the past is prologue. You know, this has all happened before. Right. All you're running around, all you're being busy, your ratings. And, this is this is history. This is all it happened before, and if you're smart, you'll see it all, perhaps more calmly, and you won't overreact.
to these situations. It's the United States of amnesia, as Gordon yes. Vidal said. Exactly. And of course, yeah. if we don't understand history, we are doomed to repeat it as we are yeah. time and time could also again. argue that that media is driven uh, by, by dollars, the greed. You know, we, we're going back to our Wall Street theme is, you know, you have a show and you, it's not really a news show because it's really about ratings. It's mm -hmm. how many people watch it. And the only way you can get that going is with a lot of speed and a lot of zoom and a lot of fancy sets and, and people watch and then keep it moving. Don't think, keep it moving. That's why it's so nice to do a the show like this where we can actually discuss the issues in a little more depth, a little more critically. But if you both were to make a film about this generation right now, what's one facet that you think is, is the most underreported or misrepresented? I don't know about the younger generation. I have three children. Uh, I think that it's an eternal story to some degree. I think people, no matter what their fashions and their, they do have a similar uh, morality and consciousness, and uh, patterns reemerge again and again. Uh, the young man, the young woman, wants to make a way in the world, and they go about it, and, and it's not that far off than what we went through. So I see. I believe in cyclical history, and I believe that. My children are going through what I went through and what my father and mother went through, too. I think there's, I always look for those patterns first, beyond, before the superficiality mm -hmm. set in. I find with my students, and I deal with the kids that age all the time, college students and graduate students, and they care really passionately about what's going on in the world. They're all doing lots of volunteer work. What I found in this generation, unlike Oliver and I, my generation, is that they treat the symptoms. They're not asking the questions about what's the root cause of all these problems. So they care, they try to change things, they try to reform things, but it's more superficial. And what we're challenging them to do is look at the patterns. Look what's happened from the 1890s all the way through to today. Look at the consistency of the wars, the interventions, the military expenditures, the paranoia, the fear of outsiders, the repression, and, and get at the root. What's really causing that? What's making the system as a whole sick in certain ways and how can we root out those deeper causes and how we understand that and begin to change that. The Occupy movement did some of that. There have been times in the 1930s, the 1870s and 80s, the 1960s when people were challenging it on that scale. We want the country to begin thinking those big questions again. What is our past? How did we get here? What are the possibilities for the future? What have we done wrong and what can we get right? Yeah. I mean, are, do you think these superficialities and the conventional wisdom that we hear are perpetuated to keep us in a perpetual state of war, like the, the tentacle, you know, kind of the, the surveillance apparatus, the military industrial complex, in order to keep that running? Is that that's, why these that's broader... 451, yeah. you know, you got the television walls and people and the jets are flying off and nobody even pays any attention. Uh, I don't know if it's quite so deliberate by, on the part of Ailes and company at Fox, but that seems to be the effect, dumbing down the population to the point where they can't think critically, and then you can pull anything over their eyes. They've got a five-minute attention span and a five-minute memory of what happened in the past. We're saying, learn your history, study this, and think about what the alternatives are. Think deeply. Think utopian. Think of utopian ways about how different the world could be and how much better it could be if we start to organize it rationally in the interest of people, not in the interest of profit, not in the interest of Wall Street, not in the interest of the military, but the interest of our common humanity, the six billion of us who occupy this planet. What an amazing concept to entertain, and I hope that we see that in this lifetime thing. It's an ambitious series. I hope, uh, I hope, I think, I'm hoping that it will go on through time. I based it, the model of it was The World at War, which was made by the BBC in the 1970s about the world of World War II. And uh, it was a beautifully done thing. I like this series, which is cut with a lot of care. I mean, it's like, these are 10 feature films, like one hour each. It's cut with a lot of love. No talking heads, pure narration, mm. music, beautiful music, and sometimes clips of films that make our point or don't make our point right. another way. But we, may, we, we try to keep it flowing like a, like a young person could enjoy it, like a movie. I'm glad you did. Yeah, beautiful archival footage as well mixed in with, with the yeah. cinematic um, accents. It's a really incredible series. And thank you so much for your time, thank you. your cousin, and thank and you. Oliver Stone. Abby, you're terrific. Thank you so much.